Yeah, so Vanessa, we'll start with you with, I'm just curious for all of you, how your relationship with tennis has evolved over the years. Um, I have always loved tennis for me. I loved competing as a junior. I played at Duke and it was an amazing experience. I loved playing on the tour. It's hard. Tennis is very hard. It is, uh, when things aren't going well and you're all on your own on the court, it's hard. But um, I loved it. And all the skills now that I take into my career post uh, tennis. And then I play with my kids. I And I now, or for the last decade, sit on the board of the WTA, as you guys know, uh, representing the players and chairing the player council. And we are fighting for women's rights and fighting for equality and fighting for our sport, which to me is so important. So it's a sport that it's really, they say it's a lifelong sport. It's truly been a lifelong sport for me. What about that's you, beautiful. Sharon? Oh my gosh, I mean, <laughs> um, that's such a subjective question, right? But uh, for me, I, I just feel like, you know, I used to see it as like a sport that was, I just saw winning and, and, and losing and that was it. And now for me, you know, as I've gotten older and I've experienced so much, I, I feel like it's so much more about personal growth for myself. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, finding the joy in the day to day and also finding the joy in, in the downs because there are so many, like Vanessa said, like it is hard. It's not just yeah. a difficult sport. You know, you go on the court with against one other person, one's going to win, one's going to lose. It's, it's also hard to know that, you know, you go into a tournament and only one person's going to win and, you know, 63 yeah. other people are going to be disappointed. Like those are horrible yeah. odds, right? Yeah. And just... See, recognizing that and just recognizing that like you, you gotta you gotta change your perspective of what you know um what it means to win you know it's not necessarily just an outcome yeah. it's it's also about your own growth and and how did you handle adversity how did you rise when things got really challenging so for me that that shift from this like little girl kind of you know fighting to win and and make my parents proud on the side it's just really so much more about um, me as a person and growing as a person through everything all the injuries all the you know beautiful moments too and incredible highlights and sort of like wow i'm so proud of the person I've become because of this sport? Mine are somewhat similar to yours. I mean, when I was a little girl, I truly loved the sport, no matter winning, losing. Um, but then it came to a point where I felt like I put too much pressure on myself. Um, society put a lot of pressure on me and also my team, my parents at one point. But then winning and losing started feeling like a self-worth thing. So whenever I would lose, I would literally sit in my room and just cry all night. If I won, I basically loved myself, per se. And um, like I said, like you, it was more of a personal growth thing. I feel like now I'm on a better journey where I love myself no matter what. Um, I look myself in the mirror every morning and I'm like, I love this person, whether I win or lose. We love you too. But, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I love you guys. Um, but also uh, with injuries, it's, it's a huge challenge. And also um, what you're doing right now along with WTA, I feel like I'm in the stance where I can stand up for what I, what I believe in. Uh, equality, women's rights, all of that, and it's given me more confidence to this sport. And I know I'm just starting, but I know I'm I'm not finished. Jennifer, what about you? I agree with what's been said. My journey is a little different. I started out as a fan, actually. I used to love to watch tennis on TV. I grew up in a small town on the East Coast, and I told my parents I wanted to learn how to play tennis. And there were no indoor tennis courts, so after three or four years, I had to move to Toronto to start training. Um, played junior tennis, played college tennis, and then gave it up and went to law school. And through that process, all of the things that I learned as an athlete and as a tennis player started to come back to me. The discipline, the working on teams, learning how to respond to no, learning how to respond to yes and yeah. so once I got through that part of my journey I really wanted to think about ways that I could start giving back so I started giving back volunteering my time with a tennis charity with a local tennis club and eventually got involved with Tennis Canada and now sit on the chair of the board and it's interesting because at this level as a woman 
there were times on the court when I had to learn to lose with grace and win with humility. And I find I'm having to do the same thing in the boardroom now. Mm -hmm. And um, the whole giving back piece to the sport and to the women coming up and hopefully one day you'll be inspired when your playing careers are over to start thinking about getting involved in the sport at a different level on a volunteer basis is truly rewarding. It is. I, I once heard a quote and it was about how um, like we just need to find our voice and I've always seen it as you already have a voice you just need to have the confidence and the support around you to have that voice be listened to or heard and Bianca you kind of spoke about it of it kind of brings you that confidence now in terms of giving back. Where do you think that confidence has grown from? Has it just been internal? Has it been from the other women and people around you supporting you? I think it's everything. I think it's my personal growth, having to go through a lot of downs and then, you know, having to pick myself up again. Um, and also the people around me. I mean, I think I'm in an era right now with so many successful women, Canadian women to be exact, um, that we can just kind of like bounce off of each other. And that's what I love. And I think that's what also gives me confidence. And just to also kind of tie into what everyone has been saying is like, you know, how Vanessa and Jen, like you, you know, you've, you've had your, your career and now you've sort of gone on this path of, of giving, giving back and trying to help build the sport of tennis and help it grow. And I think that's sort of a really interesting thing um, in talking about how, how tennis has evolved for me and, and also for, for Bianca, I would imagine, is we now are in an age of, of social media. Like we have that a platform, too. right? And we don't necessarily just have to wait for our playing careers to be over to stand up and have a voice and speak about something, you know, and through traveling and everything I've learned in my career, like I, I use my platform to share my life as a tennis player, but also to talk about things that are important to me. Like I, I, I think it's so important to stand up for, for what you think is right and, and support each other, not, you know, using your platform yeah. to like compare or to compete. put someone down exactly yeah. to compete, yeah. but supporting, you know, Bianca does well in a tournament, Layla does well in a tournament, Rebecca, you know, Jeannie, like we support each other and also other women that are doing incredible yeah. things. The Olympics just happened, like we need to support that and also causes, like for myself, you know, I think it's so important to give back to tennis. It's been a sport that's been incredible. I think we need more female role models in tennis. That's one thing yeah. that I know growing up, I did not have enough um, female role models to look up to. And I want to be one of those. And I'm thinking about that as I'm closer and closer to eventually retiring. But also, you know, things that are important to me. Sustainability is really important to me. The WTA Tour, I know, and the ATP Tour are now taking more steps towards taking care of our planet. And I think that's really, really important. And using that platform to yeah. sort of share our evolution um, through this whole process of sport, I think is really amazing and incredible. It's something that we have that in the past, I think other generations didn't necessarily have. Yeah. Even doing things like this, I mean, yeah. someone might consider it little, but I think it goes a really long way. Yeah, definitely. Well said. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> and, and more, more broadly to, to our players on our tour, so Sh Sharon, Bianca, and I, I have a lot of exposure to our player council. And, these women are, they're amazing. So we've got right now, you've got Sloane Stevens, we've had Madison Keys, uh, Gabby Dabrowski, um, great Canadian doubles player, uh, Kiki, Kiki Wadenovich. The list is, and Venus has been on it, Serena. These women are amazing. And if you think about what we just had to deal with over the last two years, COVID, you know, in the fall, the huge stance we took on China. And these women are so resolute around doing what's right and leading from the front and being being leaders in our sport, but also leaders overall. Like here was the WTA who took this huge stance on equality in China. And you know, it's the NBA didn't do it, you know, that golf hasn't done it, but the WTA did it, and it was on the backs of these players who just they put integrity and they put principles and they put leadership behind anything else. And it's for me, it's one of the great joys of being in this position is you just I, we get wowed by by what they can do and how you guys are such great leaders in this sport. We couldn't do it without yeah. both of you, obviously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could. You, you guys could. They, they are amazing. They're the, uh, and uh, all you players are really the engine. And when you think about what that means for the future of tennis, you know, you have these young girls, especially these young Canadian girls that are coming up, 
who are spending hours and hours on the tennis court mm -hmm. and then they check their social media and they see the causes that Sharon's supporting. They see how Bianca is handling various situations in her life and you know, how Serena's managing all of the press related to whether or not she's gonna retire and is she ever gonna get there and is she ever gonna break records? And at least outwardly to see these things being handled with class and grace and voices being used, I'm really, really excited to see where the game is going because these, these young true. girls are so young, they're so impressionable, there's so much at stake right now in women's tennis in particular because everyone wants to watch it across Canada, we can't build enough facilities for people to play in, which is a really good problem wow. to have. And it's just great for these kids to see what these players are doing, and in particular women supporting each other. And the one thing I'd add is it's not only the girls, it's the boys. That you can, these women are inspiring these little boys as well, mm -hmm. which is, That's I true. don't think you would have said that 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've seen through history how hard it can be to do the right thing. And in tennis, Billie Jean King and the original nine, they dealt with that. How hard, I guess, especially from an executive level and boardroom level, how challenging is it to do the right thing? Oh, it's hard. I mean, what we did with China, I mean, we, we gave up a huge amount of income. Our players did. Um, our year in championships are in China, and that's been suspended. All our tournaments in the fall are in China. Um, we have sponsors in China, and so it's it's hard. And but it, you know, I think it's going to work out well for us. And I think all of our players felt good about it. I mean, there are repercussions this year in terms of our prize money levels, in terms of our bonus pools. But our players backed it 100%. And and I think. I think we're out of that and out of respect for our principles. I think we're going to see some really positive things come out of that. I think that's right. I, you know, there's, there are certainly times where different things come into play. If we do the right thing, how will it affect our brand? If we do the right thing, are we bringing risk to the organization? And I remember a couple of years ago, I was in Phoenix and I met with a couple of Larry Nasser's victims. And I said to them, what can I take back to tennis in Canada if, if there was one message that I can deliver to my board and to everybody else in our federation, what is that? And their response was, do the right thing from the beginning. Do the right thing from the beginning, no matter what it costs. And I hold that dear. And every time we're faced around the boardroom table with a question, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing for tennis? Are we doing the right thing for our player? Are we doing the right thing for our coach? And if that answer is yes, then we do it. How have you learned then in turn, because sometimes I struggle with, you want other people to do the right thing and, and there's an internal frustration and struggle, but you don't want to let that frustration out too much because it could affect like reaching your end goal. How do you all and have you dealt and perhaps evolved within that personal frustration? I can jump on that a little bit. We've all said it many times. You mentioned Billie Jean King, pressure is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And I remind myself of that all the time. I'm so privileged to be sitting here with these women. I'm so privileged to be representing Tennis Canada. I'm on the Davis Cup Committee. This is a privilege. So every time I'm sitting at the table and I start to feel that anxiety, I remind myself of how lucky I am to be here and it sort of takes care of itself. It really does. And Billie Jean King, that reflection, the boldness through which she behaved in order to allow us to be here is my inspiration. You're a better person than I. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes we yell or I yell. <laughs> a girl. Uh, you know, but sometimes we just we really have to fight and yeah. fight hard for for what we believe in. And sometimes we'll say, I mean, in our player council meetings, we'll say, what would Billie Jean King do? What would Billie Jean really, King do? Really, I love yeah. that. Yeah, Absolutely, such, you know, I love that. She's an Absolutely. amazing leader. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know from a boardroom perspective, I don't really have, um, uh, uh, you know, that lens yet. to maybe speak to. Yet, yet, yet. hopefully. <laughs> I, would, I would love to have an opportunity like that. Now, um, from the perspective of um, being in a situation uh, with other people or, you know, just in a certain circumstance and having to, you know, choose what to do if I feel conflicted. Uh, one thing I've really realized is I find that 
you know, it's really important to, to, you know, do everything that, you know, has been spoken about here. I think you, you have to fight for it. And at the same time, you have to uh, remember that this is a privilege. And I think that's so important. And I also feel to add to that is that um, I think the best way that we can affect change is to be be the change you wish to see in the world. And I know that that's such a cliche thing, <laughs> but it truly is that having, you know, st stepping in your power and, 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 and um, you know, exuding what you expect and, and not um, letting down, not changing your... Yeah, um, at the end of the day, what did I do today? Right. What, what right. little thing did yes. I do today to that's make right. change? That's right. And, and just kind of putting out what you expect the world around you to look like or what you would like. And I think that, cause you know, I, I don't think you can really guilt people into doing the right thing or shame people into doing the right thing. I, I don't think that those types of results are very effective personally, but if you really just, um, you know, try to be the example that you want to see and, and just, you know, set a boundary of, I will not accept anything less. I think that there's a lot of power in that personally. Like you said, you can't really force someone to do something. Mm -hmm. It has to come from them personally. And I grew up in a household where I was always able to say what was on my mind. And uh, my mom would always say, always do the right thing. Always stand up for what you believe in is the right thing. And uh, I think having that growing up really helped me uh, pursue the sport in um, a more positive lens because one of my goals growing up um, is to use tennis as a platform to create change in the world. Um, pressure's a privilege, like we're talking about. It's just, it's super satisfying. And I think, um, in general, I should, I think it should be one of um, the purposes in life for everybody is to, you know, help contribute to change the world in a better way. Well, we've referenced Billie Jean King a lot already in our short conversation. When I say her name, what comes to mind to you, Bianca? Uh, equality. Uh, without the original nine, I mean, we would not be where we are today as tennis players. Um, what they have done is incredible. Uh, but I know I spoke to Billie Jean personally, and she said that one of her hopes is to have, you know, the athletes on the WTA tour, even on the ATP tour, just talk about it and spread more awareness about it because it's not finished yet. The job is not done. Mm. And um, I think, like I said before, just doing things like this, I think will help. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not done. And she's one of the most famous people in your contacts. Yeah, she yeah. is. I did say that. I did say that. <laughs> Well, I and I will speak to her on occasion just to use her as a sounding board and what she will, her message is always very consistent. It's think big. Like yeah. you guys, you got to aim high. You've got to think be big. Bold. Think bigger. Be exactly. Bold. Be bold. Think bigger than, than how you're thinking about it because she just thinks, she thinks we can just do so much more um, and there's so much room to go still and, and she's right. But the other word I'd say is when you think of her as amazing. I mean, she is just, she's one of the I most mean, remarkable a people. A lot of people said that she did nearly the impossible. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot, I think a lot of her other messages is if she can do it, we can do it. You know, if she can almost do the impossible, I think we can also almost yeah. do the impossible. And outside of tennis too, like she is someone and the WTA is a group that others look at and think, how can we, they did it, how can we now do it? So we always think of it kind of within this tennis bubble, but it's for women's sports across the world, it's a really stepping stone of, oh my gosh, this is, this is what's possible. So Bianca, you said the work's not done. So in all of your opinions, and it's a loaded question, but what is next? What still do we want to see get done? Very good question. I can speak from the opposite perspective of the player. And that is to say that quite often when we think about the lack of female coaches, and the lack of female high performance coaches and what can we do to build that pipeline and build that stream and find more women coaches and train them and make the environment more compatible for them to succeed. Mm -hmm. I would also say, and I actually went to the junior nationals a couple of years ago and spoke to the under 16 girls and their careers in tennis don't have to be just about coaching. 
I would love to see more women in media. I would love to see more women in marketing, in business. Let's have the broader conversation. There's lots of women who have done their MBAs, who are giving back, who are getting paid, who are unpaid volunteering that are, that are adding tremendously to women's sport. Mm -hmm. So let's not limit ourselves. How do we do that then? Like, why is it that there aren't more female coaches? Or is it a, you need to see it to believe it, and you need to have a, a supportive environment for them to flourish? Yeah, and I also think, just to jump on that, I know Tennis Canada, which is an amazing new initiative they've started, is now they, they have to have at least one female, uh, either coach or, or, or strength coach or some female authoritative figure on every single junior tour, which is, like, that is... Such yes, that's such an incredible addition to um, what what they're doing now for for junior players. Um, so that one, like more more things like that, we have to that encourages you know the necessity for female coaches, for example. And I know, like Jen said, it's not just coaches. You know, it's not just tennis. It's it's every aspect of life. But you know, I I also feel that um, because it everyone's using their voice more you know equality is is such a huge part of, of women's voices now I believe it's really becoming more and more and more in the forefront of society and I think that I feel it's almost a responsibility to not just give back to the sport but to impact the sport in a way that I feel I wish I had that impact when I was that age and I really think that you know, there's a lot of amazing male coaches out there. Absolutely, there's no no doubt about that. But to have to have been able to actually have the honor of working with, um, for example, Rini Simpson um, in the past, like she helped shape me as a human being, and and she she was an incredible impact in my life, and is also honestly a huge reason as to why I want to get into coaching when I do finish. I think it's just I can't imagine who I would be without her, and. Um, I think the more that we have exposure to that and, and those juniors are now sort of um, going to be able to get that opportunity on every single tour they have now um, when they go with Tennis Canada, that's going to, you know, that's going to create a, create a trickle effect, you know, everyone's going to be impacted um, by that and it's going to be incredible. So having, you know, in, like, rules implemented like this and, and people standing up, people wanting to, to, to do that and creating space in tennis and, and other environments around the world for women is just like it's we just need to keep doing that. We need to keep pushing for that. And, and I think it's such an incredible mm -hmm. impact. I think it does start in the household and it does start in schools. I feel that um, there should be more conversations with your kids about equality, about, you know, all these gender differences. And I feel that if it can start there, uh, I mean, it's a great start, right? Um, but then also, like for instance, in schools, there could be more after school programs uh, for tennis or for other sports. Um, going back to the female coaches side, I feel like there could be more or different initiatives, let's say, in the coaching programs, more support on that. Um, because, I mean, when you're a younger girl, I feel that female coaches could better relate mm -hmm. to them and they might feel more comfortable as well uh, versus being with a man. Um, so I think that could also. Definitely. Help. I think also just what you said sort of made me think, sorry to jump in, but, um, you know, when you have a strong female role model raising young females like that's that's how we raise strong women mm -hmm. you know what i mean is 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 making sure that and those men. And, and men, men. That's, right. Right. that's right that's right imagine if we had 10 andy murrays right exactly we definitely need correcting the media that's right speaking out using that's right their voice it's a mentality change that mm -hmm. needs to happen and like you said it needs to happen in schools and you know i think that that's that's really the shift that that is going to be massive and also the initiative of Tennis Canada with building more indoor courts is really amazing as well. I mean, it won't only give opportunities for young girls, but also for young males. I remember growing up, it was super hard to find indoor courts living in Canada. Uh, but then I was obviously fortunate enough to uh, be with Tennis Canada. You guys had amazing facilities, but I think that initiative is also very amazing. 160 courts, I think, right? So it's we're amazing. hoping for amazing. We kind of got off track, but in a good way. So I want I want to hear from your perspective: is what is next for the WTA and women's tennis? What still needs to be done? Oh, there's a lot that needs to be done. I mean, we've come a long way 
sometimes I think we have to remind ourselves that we're at the forefront. I mean, the equal prize money at the Grand Slam, equal prize money at our top four tournaments below it, but we don't have, um, you know, the Canadian Open is an example, different tiers of tournaments, but we don't have equal prize money. And, you know, at some point we need to, sh it, we need to get there and shift to the mentality of how do we do it? And then I think also, how do you get sponsors behind it and really supporting equality? Because I think that's something that more companies yeah. are getting behind. But we've got, you know, we, you know, TV doesn't, still doesn't recognize women's sports as it does men's sport. Um, the uh, sponsorship is, is still not the same and it really differs by country. So there, there are some countries where, where um, you know, women just do not still command the same respect as Man, it's just entirely pathetic. But so we've come a long way, but um, we know we've got we've got a lot to do to support our players, to support the sport, and to remain leaders for for others. How can the promotion of doubles help with that, Sharon? Well, you know what's really interesting is um, doubles is actually like worldwide played more than singles is at um, like a, at a club level, a recreational, yeah. right. That's very true. So you and I play doubles. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I've played with you. You're very good. We're well, undefeated actually. Yeah. So, I you know, you. I, I am looking for a partner <laughs> for 2022. So, but that's one thing I really fi found has been a very interesting statistic that I, I just feel again, like kind of tying it into women's sports in general. Is it the, it's, you know, is it because they're not given enough airtime that women's sports aren't watched? Or is it, you know, was there ever even a trial of, okay, let's, let's air women's sports more and see how that goes, you know, the kind of the chicken or the egg. And I think, you know, that sort of ties into women's doubles is because, you know, it's something that is so relatable for people around the world because most people play doubles at a recreational level, but the airtime isn't there. And I truly, I, I would love to, to you know, challenge uh, whoever's in charge of that TV, the TV rights and, and whoever is in charge of that whole sort of uh, space, like maybe throw doubles on there more, see what happens because it's something that people really love it's to watch so entertaining it is to it's to entertaining me, I, sometimes yeah. i prefer to watch doubles and when yeah. you look at, at the reasons why young girls quit tennis mm -hmm. right they talk about things like body image they talk mm -hmm. about not having role models and they talk about not playing as a team yeah. so what if they were able to turn on the tv and see more of sharon playing seeing more of gabby playing yeah definitely and it's more it's it's also on top of that like it's really fun to to be part of a team and, um, you know, tennis is a tough sport, as we were all talking about, being out there alone. And um, I think that, you know, having that on the platform might really encourage women and young girls to, to stick with the sport. That's, oh, I love tennis and I can do this for a living with someone else as a partner on my team. Like, that sounds great. So I really think, honestly, if doubles was given a chance to be aired more, I'd be really curious to see what those numbers would look yeah. like. How much, Sharon, for uh, you and Bianca, how much has competing for Team Canada and the Billie Jean King Cup, how much has that just influenced you positively personally and, and professionally on the tennis court? But even I'm curious personally. I guess I'll go. Um, it's been really amazing. It's one of my favorite tournaments to play because tennis is such an individual sport. Um, even though, I mean, you have your team and the background and whatnot, but in Billie Jean King Cup, you literally have a team supporting you right there on the sidelines, which is different. It's different. And then knowing that you're playing for your country in Canada, such an amazing country, uh, just makes it that much better. Um, and being around such strong, independent women gives me that confidence to um, continue to stand up for what I believe in. And, you know, coming out of uh, Billie Jean King Cup and starting, you know, playing other tournaments, I just always want to put, be put back in that uh, position because uh, I remember we always have such good conversations there about different things and um, it's very eye-opening. I love it. I echo everything you said. Um, to, to add to that, uh, for myself, I would say um, that I actually have learned so much being able to have the privilege to be on the bench with some of the captains that we've had, like Rini captain, Simpson yeah. was, was a captain for a very long time. And I remember just being able to, play, it felt like I was playing a match with her. 
I learned so many like golden nuggets that I carried with me throughout my career. You know, five four in the third set, she would sit down with me and she would give me just like pieces of gold that I would have never been able to learn otherwise. And I know for a fact that that helped me be a better player, a better person. Um, and and then you know Heidi Altebach now is is the Billie Jean King Cup captain for Canada, and she's also been you know such an incredible um, asset to the team, and she's such a wonderful person, and she she helps the players so much, and I just feel that that as well is such a huge thing that you know I don't think you really realize until you're on the Billie Jean King Cup team, and then um, yeah, it's just a nice little break too. Tennis being an individual sport, all of a sudden you come yeah. together as a team in a country for a couple of weeks a year. It's just like a nice little you know reset, refresh in the middle of like a super long season, right? Yeah. Love that. We've talked a lot about support, and support can come in many different ways. It can come, as we've discussed, financially. Um, in terms of the WTA and being a female tennis player, there are different um, there are different things physically that you would deal with compared to a man. And we've seen like Serena Williams win the Australian Open while pregnant. Women coming back from having a baby. Those are just a, a couple of the more obvious uh, examples. But in what ways do you think there could still be more support for women physically on tour? Sharon, you, you get this one. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> just to sort of jump right on the, the, the difference, the very obvious difference between men and women is the fact that women do have children themselves and then return to tour. And I, I actually played doubles for, for about a year with um, Katerina Bondarenko, who has two kids. And I remember when we would travel and play tournaments together, just the nightmare that it was to get, you know, the credentials and the visas and the, you know, spots in the hotel and childcare at tournaments. Like it was just wild to see, you know, the lack of support for um, a woman that has two children and is choosing to continue to compete on tour. And at the time she was you know, she had a ranking that was top 100 in singles and doubles, like amazing player, amazing person, and such a huge role model for Ukraine and also for women's tennis, a former Grand Slam champion, you know, and, and they were, it was like, it wasn't even helping her, you know, it was like making it so difficult for her to get to the tournament and, and find a way to have her kids there and her family um, taken care of. So I, I really feel like that is really at the um, forefront when you ask that question. Um, the support for um, the fact, just the, the really glaring difference between men and women in general. It really needs to be supported, not something like that, that feels almost like an inconvenience. And you can cut this, you should cut this, but it always comes up with our player council about these women wearing white at Wimbledon. Oh, yeah, oh, oh yeah that gosh. is a little. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, think about that on center court. Yeah, yeah, what if something happens? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And cut this too, but at the Toronto that. Lawn, I got called out for, and I was the president of Toronto Lawn, wearing black undershorts. Undershorts. They underneath. are very strict. When I first joined, I was like, they are but very I, strict. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, I, I have a whole, we could talk for another 30 yeah. minutes on this all white attire rule person. The, the one <laughs> thing, just just going back for a second oh. on what, what are, where are we, what could we do? I mean, if you look at the ratings at the U.S. Open over the past several years, I think beyond concluding, I think your year, yes. the women's finals mm. drew Way more, more than broadcast. the men's finals. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And so there's, there's a bit of a disconnect still into the quality, the interest, and the pay uh, and the TV deals and the sponsorship. And it's just, we're, gonna, we're getting closer and we're going to make that connection. But the evidence is there. The I mean, evidence is there. And not just women. with tennis. Look at the women's hockey game at the Olympics. Yeah, exactly. The oh most watched yeah. event of the Olympics yeah. was Canada U.S. Yeah. women's hockey. Yeah. Well, in the like, U.S. and Canada. In the U.S. and, and last, Canada. Last September was in Layla, the most Googled, one yes. of the most Googled people in Canada uh, during, during that period. I mean, yeah. it's, it's amazing and we need to talk about it more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't want to sit and compare, but I do feel like the women's game, um, why it's being so broadcasted is because there's so much more variety than the men's tennis, I feel like. And I know the men's tennis now, um, there's more youngsters coming up and 
you know, defeating the big three. Um, but at least for me, I enjoy watching women's tennis, not only because I am a woman, but because of that variety. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to see young female athletes do so well mm -hmm. under pressure, under big scenes, like Layla, like me when I was only 19. You know, I feel like that does catch the oh, people's you're eyes. Still a young you're still young. <laughs> I, know, I, I talk well, about this like uh, it was 20 uh, years ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I was just on the phone with my 11-year-old daughter right before, uh, right before this, and the last thing she said is, "Please tell Bianca that I <laughs> that I really like the way she plays." Oh. <laughs> See, I love that. I love hearing things like that. It's so amazing. So. But when you do look at some of the youngsters on tour, I mean, you look at Coco Golf. I think she's only 17. Mm or she's 16, I think. Like, it's just incredible, but it's so powerful to see that. But when you think for, even from a brand perspective in terms of the product, it's like success doesn't just come from how good the tennis is, but kind of what we've discussed in terms of the personalities and what those players represent themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, you guys are all running like, businesses, right? Our your own business little business. Is your brand. On social and media, exactly social media right. is so big. Yeah. And it's kind of scary because, um, I have this thing where I live by being impeccable with my word and being impeccable with your word means that you can use your word for good or for bad. And I feel that social media can go either way, which is kind of sad, but in, in another way it's good because so many people talk about such important events and they stand up for what you believe in. But I feel that um, managing that and we're both doing that very well is being impeccable with your word, but in a good way. Mm. I think that's super important. So you're talking about finding the balance between managing your brand and your worth versus speaking out and using your voice. Are you talking about that? No, I mean, just something that I live by. And that's not only for social media. That's like when I talk about anything, I want to be able to use my word for good because your word can be used for something completely opposite. And I mean, I don't want to go into so much history, but look what the terrible German man did back in, you know, mm -hmm. he used his word for something bad, but so many people believe that. Yeah. And it's like how powerful it is. That's, yeah. that's all I'm saying. So as we kind of bring this conversation to a close, um, I guess I'll kind of just leave the floor open. I'm, I'm curious if you'd like to answer a question is what are you most proud of? And whether that's just for you personally or professionally or what you see in this industry that is tennis. Um, and just if there's anything you'd like to add that we haven't touched on. I would say two things. One of the things I'm really proud of as chair of Tennis Canada is in my five years sitting around that boardroom table, most of the time, it's the men raising gender equity and equality and opportunity. Wow. Rarely do I have to raise my voice when it comes to those issues. So that's something I'm really proud of from a Tennis Canada perspective. Personally, I'm proud of the fact that I believe I'm now in a position where I can drop the ladder down. Yeah. I'm definitely proud of that as well, you know, having a voice to speak up about things like this, sitting down with all of you has been incredible and knowing that we can make a difference, uh, I think that's very important. And also to, I mean, all the little girls out there, I mean, you guys can do anything you set your mind to, just believe in yourself, think big, because we're here for you and there's so many other women out there here for you. Mm. I um, I am so proud to be part of a sport that paves the way for women's sport. I know tennis is definitely, we, and we talked about this earlier, is sort of um, wh where other sports sort of look to. They look to the WTA, and, and it's incredible to be a part of an organization that is really a trailblazer for women's sports. And uh, for myself, I'm so proud of the strength that um, this sport has given me. I wouldn't be who I am without tennis. It's not just a job for me at all. It's not just a paycheck. Um, it's really just built 
so many um, character traits and, and there's been so much uh, growth from being a professional tennis player. I'm very, very proud of the strength and the, the blessings and the gifts and the Amen. lessons. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm similar to you, I'm proud, of, I'm proud of our sport and our women are such leaders in sports and we could do so much more but we've just, we've come so far and I think we've done so much and I think sometimes we forget to stop and maybe give ourselves a little pat on the back for it. Um, and I'm always a very proud Canadian and, and from a tennis perspective, so proud of our sport. I mean, we're this little country who is one of the leaders in professional tennis. And it's, you guys have all done Players Tennis Canada, such an amazing job to get there. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I'm really grateful to be part of conversations like this too, but I feel like especially, maybe it's even the pandemic, but in the last couple of years, I feel like these more open, vulnerable conversations are much more common and helpful, I think. 100%. And necessary. Yeah. I think very necessary. necessary. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, well, I feel pretty good. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Me too. Hope you do too. <laughs> I'm sure we could sit here and talk for hours.